section because I have a note for you. I like that we have lots of room for notes, uh, but you have to write small. <sighs> anyway, I'm so excited. And then I come here and we, they wind me up in the morning, he's Bible study. He's pushing all my buttons. I don't want to rattle. Let me take that off. So, some of you don't know me. My name is Tom Beyer. You might read about me in the bulletin uh, because you guys pray for me and the prayers are heard on the other side of the world. I'm so thankful for it. I want you to know so I don't forget that there are lots of folks praying for you. And um, I hope to have, I'm going to be here till the end of August, and then I return to China for my third year. But I hope to have some exciting announcements for um, some things that are planned for the Northeast. And uh, so things are, plans are coming together. I don't want to speak prematurely because I just got here Friday from D.C., and I'm still a secret agent, all right? I have my, I have my spy badge on because I was in DC, uh, so I have some interesting things. But I hope to have some, some good announcements. But anyway, I live in China, for those of you who don't know, and um, I teach English at a tech school, and what an amazing opportunity. And so I'm going to share with them uh, some of this. I, I hope to get this if I can figure out how to use my computer. Uh, my brother Dave had to get me a new computer because all my technology rebelled uh, while I was in China and uh, they don't really allow rebellion it's kind of ironic um, that my, my technology all rebelled against me <clears throat> but anyway there's lessons in everything that we do everything that we do there's lessons if you are open to receive these lessons okay um, the big key point is in case you didn't know Jesus lives it, Jesus lives. He's alive and well. He lives in his church, and the church fills the whole earth. And I cannot tell you what a tremendous blessing it has been in these travels. When I left here, seems like a long time ago, I know, it was 2014, and I've traveled all over the world since. And just before I got here, I flew in, I flew from Beijing, the capital of China, to Washington, D.C., the capital of the United States, uh, on June 25th, and I spent, I think, two days here at my mom's, and then I had to rush out. I got my car all ready to go, and I got it, I headed down to Texas, and I started in East Texas, and then went to West Texas, and then up to Michigan, and then Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania, back to D.C., and I just came here from D.C. I got here uh, late Thursday night. I spent the night with my brother in Trumbull and got back here Friday afternoon. While I was in D.C., I said, um, I have a brother that works there, and I called Gordon, and I said, Gordon, I'm in D.C. What do I need to see? And because uh, I just, I don't even think I'm in this time zone yet. And uh, I walk around perpetually thinking I'm forgetting something. That's just my life now. I'm just always thinking I'm forgetting something. So Gordon said, well, you know, the Bible Museum is there. Ah, that's it. I knew I should have known that. It opened in 2017. That's the first place. And he said, go to the Spy Museum. Uh, we went there. I don't remember what year it was, Gordon, but we went there and we got off the Metro, I think right next to it. And I said, I got to come back here. Well, I did. I went to the spy museum, so I got my credentials. And, uh, but I spent most of the day in uh, the Bible museum. Uh, they're right down the street from each other. So I got into uh, Rome, I mean Washington, D.C. I got into Washington, D.C., and I met my brother. He works there. I met him after work, and we went to this famous uh, downtown uh, grill. Uh, it, was, it was beautiful, but it's, it's out of my league. Uh, anyway, I, the, I could relate it like, like the Cheesecake Factory. You know, you walk in there and everything's like stone pillars and it's big and it's, you know, it's beautiful. Um, but he wouldn't let me at his job because I'm not cleared, even though I'm a spy, I'm not cleared to go there. So I had to stay at this, uh, the par park, 
the I don't know the Hilton and it, it overlooks the Washington Monument so anyway after dinner we walk I got to walk the Capitol the White House the Washington Monument the Lincoln Memorial and then Martin Luther King Jefferson you know all of them walked around the, the whole it was beautiful and they just had some bad storms if you've been watching the news and anyway I, I the next day I spent the day over in the museum uh, this Bible Museum it opened in 2017 and it's just uh, beautiful it's beautiful uh, I would recommend that if you want to take a trip there do yourself a favor and do like an online course of uh, basic Bible history because there's so much stuff there it's six floors and the building is kind of kind of I think it's built and shaped kind of like an arc even though it's a brick building but it has this glass observatory on the top floor and there's six floors um, of exhibits and and interactive things and movie the movie was really wild uh, I would warn you if you go there's this like virtual they don't tell you it's a virtual ride but it's it's I've never did one of these you stand and lean on this thing and the whole platform moves and blows air on you and it, and it flies you through all around DC and it shows you all the um, well not all of them but some of the 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 word that's you know the foundation of the very city um, and so but a couple of disappointing things that uh, and I was talking to um, my my host family in Texas at sunset and she said you ought to write a letter you know and tell them this so number one the big disappointment I have with with this if I'm going to critique it I would say it's in Washington DC it's in the heart it's it's right next to the mall and the Washington Monument and everything and I would think that this city that's built on the foundation of this word that this word is truth that that would be a main theme and I missed it or it's just not there okay that in order to have the United States be united uh, and have freedom that we have a system of government that's for the people by the people for the people that that system only works if you have a standard that you observe that this is what makes us free and I will mention that throughout this makes us free freedom is not a man-made concept and no more did it ever become clear to me that it is not in man to direct his own steps than walking through this capital and I spent I had the same well similar Beijing is just a bigger version of Washington DC it's beautiful everything's clean um, but it's um, it, 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 it's whitewashed tombs okay it it it, it it's wrong okay that's number one this whole experiment into the freedom of men that freedom comes from God and it's our God-given right and government should protect that freedom that's only stands if we have this the other thing is the the artifacts there and this really struck me they have Bibles a lot of Bibles but what I don't think they do this with the with the actual Bibles or parchments or scrolls but all these things that you've seen if you do, study Bible history at all uh, you know the stones the Mumbari stone or uh, the, the stele they call it and the, the Rosetta stone and all these things they're digitally probably with a 3d printer I, I'm fascinated by this stuff but they're recreations they have the Liberty Bell but everything they're they're replicas of the real thing but they're beautiful and they're on display there but the the Bibles uh, the pages and everything one thing that you can't miss is that when you look at these scrolls these Bibles all this information it is worn out from use it's worn out from use I I had a different take when Paul said that you know the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because they they go back and they search the scripture I don't think he was saying that um, that they were in some way uh, that the Thessalonians weren't doing that I think he was provoking them to 
you guys need to do this more and more, okay? So, they have all these artifacts, this is my, just my second observation there. They show you the whole progression, it's not just the Bible, it's where all the written expression of divine information from the beginning comes from and how it was preserved. And again, it's like if you walk through the ark, I think there's only one question you have if you visit the ark in Kentucky, that did they build it? But if they built it, they, it, it, it is what it says it is. But you can't miss that if you go through it. And if you go through this museum, you can't escape that, the how amazing, this did not come from men, which we're gonna talk about today. This did not come from men. And when you see the, the transmission and the preservation of the word through catastrophe, through the history of mankind, that is not possible. Man cannot do that, okay? And yet, so they have this big display about the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, that discovery, and they, they, they pulled these scrolls out of the side of this mountain, and they don't make this point, which is the big point, and there's a lot of data, if you, if you want to research this, there's a lot of data on this. One of the amazing things that when they compare the text, they didn't have to correct our Bible. Yeah, I, I, you cannot understate that. That's such a big deal. This did not have to be corrected. There may have been the, the books, the order, everything was the same. They're looking at documents that, that are before Christ in the Old Testament and nothing in our Bible is out of place. The, I get this, um, you know, people say, how can we trust the translations or the transmission? Um, wow, if you go there, but I was disappointed that they don't even have the data there. The data is readily available, and it should kind of, that's a big point. To me, it's a big point, okay? That what we have is the reliable Word of God. It's the inspired Word of God. So look at Second Peter. We're going to start there in Second Peter, the verse that Gordon read. <clears throat> Second Peter in chapter 1, and Second Peter is just my favorite book right now. I've just been this, just living this. Uh, it, this is amazing. I'm going to take you through um, kind of what I do to set up from the beginning, like we were talking about Mary this morning, how do we get people from the beginning to respect the authority of the word and then motivate them to go through a transformation process. Um, and so, 2 Peter, in the verse that Gordon read is verse 19, he says, so we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. Uh, I, I, I'm reading out the NRSV. Uh, you will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place Okay, and it, it brings me back to it's not in man to direct his own path. Uh, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. All right, but now look at verse 20. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Now I heard this verse early on you know, as saying, well, that's kind of the proof text that tells you this is the word of God. Well, okay, but men could write it, all right? If I'm being, a, you know, an adversary, um, I could write whatever I want, say this is what it is. Why, why is that important? Why does Peter say that in verse 19, we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed? Let me get it. I, I, I love the different translations. In the ESV it says, verse 19 says, and we have something more sure. And I don't have time to do word studies because there are a lot of good word study, studies here in Second Peter, but we have the prophetic word. We have something more sure, the prophetic word. Okay, so is that the NASV? Oh, thank you. Oh, and he's right there, what a guy. We have the prayer. And same thing, all right? Uh, the NA, NASB, okay, says, verse 19, so we have the prophetic word made, and this one is in italics, stress, made more sure. The, 
the title, I almost said, I almost gave Claudia the title, Who's Your Daddy? I, I almost put that, but I didn't want to be cute, okay? Blessed Assurance, that song kept ringing in my head. Um, if you go back to the beginning of this letter, Peter, who's apostle, says, verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith as precious as ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, let me go back. I, this is where I like these word studies. And I, I apologize I didn't do it because I know I'm going to... I'm going to get to you. Verse 1 in the ESV, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have uh, obtained, listen to this, a faith of equal standing with ours. Peter, the super apostle, okay, says that I'm writing to you that you have a faith equal Drop down in verse 3 says, His divine power has given us everything needed for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Thus He has given us through these things His precious and very great promises so that through them you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of lust and may become participants of the divine nature. That is what we were deceived from the beginning that... God is keeping something from you, and so if you eat of this tree, you're going to get, you're going to be like God. You want to be like God, you be transformed by his word because he promised to make his home with us and renew us. And wow, so many people get the peace of God through the obedience of the gospel, but miss the joy because they get stuck in the persecution and these letters take on a whole new meaning in that that light but anyway so look what Peter does he he gives this list so he says verse 5 for this very reason what reason this reason that you have a faith equal with ours not Superman all right because I I have this miraculous power to demonstrate this is where the word is coming from, that Jesus is the foundation and the apostles were the ones that were going to communicate this. <clears throat> but he says in verse 5, for this very reason, you must make every effort to support your faith with, and he lists these qualities that Bradley talked about this morning, that why should we do this? He says, goodness, knowledge, self-control, endurance, godliness, uh, mutual affection, uh, love for if these things in verse 8 if these things are yours and increasing among you they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ for anyone who lacks these things is short-sighted and blind and is forgetful of the cleansing of past sins we were talking about this this morning in our study in Romans therefore brothers verse 10 and sisters be all the more eager to confirm your call and election for if you do this, you will never stumble. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly provided for you. Q, you see that? This was ringing in my head and, it, and it, I can't help. You know, it just, this comes out. I've been camped out in this letter for, for a long time because of the environment that I'm in, okay? Uh, but look at this in verse 12. Now, this is a key verse. Therefore, I intend to keep on reminding you of these things. These things that have you have an equal faith as the Apostle Peter, he says in verse 13, I think it right, as long as I am in this body to refresh your memory, since I know that my death will come soon, as indeed our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able to recall these things. So again, this prophetic word uh, was preserved and now, even the way they're talking, it just kind of put these words together for me in a way that I didn't understand before. It's taken a lot of study to get here, but 
it just lights me up. I get so excited now. The revelation, so this, this song was my dream last night, and I just kept popping up every time when I get together with you guys. I get so excited. Um, look at this in, in this blessed assurance. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. And when you're in the Word, wow, just, you know, I get up and I say, wow, this is a great point. This is a great revelation. And then I fall back to sleep and I get up in the morning and oh, I can't deliver it. It just doesn't come out. It's so frustrating. But I, what I found is over time, just keep staying in the Word, keep staying in the Word because it starts to all come together. And when you're talking with people, if you keep talking with people, uh, the right things come out in prayer and all of that is so vital. All right. So, but let's just finish in verse 16. He said, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so everything in this word has these, uh, if you're an engineer, has these redundancies, these checks and balances, okay? So it's not one man said, I had a good idea, uh, some angel delivered this to me, you need to live this way, it's, it's a good way. Everything in the Word of God has this redundancy so that we are without excuse. We can go back and search the Scriptures and understand the reality of it. So he says, verse 17, For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. Then he tells them, then he goes on to say in verse 19, our, our verse today, he says, but you have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. Why? Paul has the same argument where in Romans. He starts the letter, the resurrection. Peter preached in Acts chapter 2. What is it that confirms this word? The resurrection. The resurrection. You, the world is without excuse because of the resurrection. Nobody, this is key, nobody denied the resurrection. And Jesus' resurrection endorsed this word. Both Old Testament and New, he endorsed the New Testament by him giving this Holy Spirit to his apostles to lay this down. And then Peter says to preserve it for us. So that we can remind each other and build each other up. Now, why, why, am I, why am I saying that? Okay, here's my motivation. I hope this, this I harp on this a lot uh, at the other, on the other side of the world. Okay, um, Matthew 23. Matthew 23. Uh, because this is where I think... We get caught in this trap of what I say are distraction and discouragement. Alan, distraction and discouragement from ever reading the Bible. Distraction and discouragement from ever reading the Bible. We say, why do people do this? go and they say I'm saved and they go follow this group and then they start acting like the group that's human nature it's called learned behavior okay so again we talked about the environment and being modeling okay but look at what Jesus says in Matthew 23 and this is a this is a point that I just I try to nail this down because when I talk to people, especially here in this country, when I got back, um, I'm dealing with family issues around, you know, around the globe. So I go and visit them and just try to find new ways. You know, how can I, how can I make this point? Um, Matthew 23. We know this chapter is. We call it the chapter of woe, or yeah, the chapter of woes. But listen. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach and follow it. But do not do as they do, 
for they do not they do not practice what they teach they tie up heavy burdens hard to bear lay them on the shoulders of others but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them they do all their deeds to be seen by others for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long they love to have the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have people call them rabbi now verse 8 key verse but you are not to be called rabbi for you have one teacher and you are all students and call no one your father on earth for you have one father in, in heaven nor are you to be called instructor, instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. And then verse 11, he says, Now the greatest among you will be your servant. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. What is the context of this? And then he, he goes through the woes. Okay? Woe! He turns to the scribes and the Pharisees and he says, Woe, you hypocrites! Uh, for you look... Uh, you lock people out of the kingdom of heaven. You don't even go in yourselves. And, and then it just, it, and it kind of gets worse as he goes on. All right, here's the takeaway. The Hebrew writer goes back and quotes Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, when God made a new covenant. Okay? So, let me get there. Hebrews chapter 8, the Hebrew writer is, opens up the letter to the Hebrews and says, you know, in many and various ways God spoke in the past, right? Let me get it. I'm not used to this. I didn't bring back my, my book. I didn't want to travel back and forth with that one. So he says, uh, in verse 1, 1, long ago God spoke to our ancestors in many various ways by the prophets, but in these last days he's spoken to us by his, by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. The heir of all things is the resurrection. Everywhere you look now, it's the resurrection because the resurrection confirms that this is the word you can rely on. All right? And so Jesus says, call no man father, no man teacher. Why? You go to eight, Hebrews chapter 8, in verse 8, God finds fault with them and he says, The days are surely coming, says the Lord, and he's quoting Jeremiah now, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their ancestors on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. And so I had no concern for them, says the Lord. Verse 10, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. What's he saying? What, what, what's the idea here? We're told we're without excuse. And I can go back historically, and 2 Peter uses the creation and the flood uh, and the destruction um, to say there's always been these historical markers throughout time that God has made himself known so men are without excuse. There's a divine uh, order of things. Man doesn't know freedom without God. There's only, freedom is not a man-made concept. Uh, he doesn't know how to direct his own path. I, I want to develop that one. But <clears throat> the shepherds, which are the organizational structure of the church, are to guide us back into the Word. And I have this vision of the, the, these books that are just worn out from use where people were studying because the goal is to have eternal life. To have eternal life, you need the words of life. Think of it this way. Uh, I just had people tell me, you know, they, they're, they got certified to go scuba diving, all right? And scuba diving, unlike snorkeling, is you got to put the tank on and you have to have a breathing apparatus and you go under. And you ever um, notice, 
I mean, to me, if I were going on some deep sea dive, I want two tanks, okay? Because I want one tank, so wherever I go on this tank, I know I gotta head back on the second tank. You know, it's like if I get, make it this far in this tank, then I gotta get back on this tank. I feel, but once you go with one tank, I don't know about that, <laughs> okay? But the idea is, it, 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 this, these are the lessons we learn in life. Okay, everything is teaching you, God is calling you, um, but the world is distracting you and discouraging you because you know, you take that breather out of your mouth when you're down 30 feet, you're done. You cannot live without it. It's the very breath of life and you're attached to it. And it's, nobody would deny that. And you would say, we'd silly take that thing out of your mouth. Okay, your breathing apparatus. How do you live without the bread, without the words of eternal life? You, you are not living. You are dead. Dead in your trespass. And you're stuck in your way of life. And what happens is we, we have this, our human ability is we want to defer to others. The Hebrew writer even says this, right, at the end of chapter 5. <clears throat> he says... 511, about this, we have much to say. It's hard to explain since you have become dull in understanding. Verse 12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone again to teach you again. Why is he saying that when Jesus said, call no man teacher, call no man father? What's he saying? I know people that won't call their dad father. They call him pop or whatever. Because they take it literally. The context is pretty clear. Paul says, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling, right? Philippians 2.12. Um, Paul wrote to the Galatians and he said, let me not mess this up because you know it so well. Paul says, I'm astonished, Galatians 1.6, that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are confusing you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, because apostles are not perfect, and, and you had that question cue, the last question, why did Paul use this example of himself struggling with the law? Because he says, even if we, or an angel, right, from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to what we proclaim to you, everything has this redundancy. So that you can go back and confirm what the gospel is, how to obey it, and how to have the words of eternal life. And so, yes, we need teachers. Yes, we do need to be good examples. Yes, we need to build one another up. We need to know what our giftedness is uh, and use it to build up the body so we can have joy. Uh, my brother in Michigan loves to make pizza now. And he's good at it, but what a labor. I mean, he... Or two days earlier, he's up till one in the morning making dough because uh, it has to sit at the right temperature and all. And then the day we were going to have the pizza, oh my goodness, him and his son and his son's wife, the production, you know, the outdoor oven and I mean, and all the fixings, and he loves it. He loves it. It's just all oh, he's sweating and it's hot and but he's doing something he loves, and it's it's not cheap either. All right, making all the sauce and all the ingredients and ooh, man, I'm trying to put on weight. <laughs> but wow, I was in Michigan last week and I, I spoke to them a little bit and I said, you know, I have this message so, you know, it gets out and I said, you know, you know, who cuts the grass here? You know, if, if someone... Uh, you know, we have this idea that there, we come to meet here and the meeting place needs repair and we, we assign jobs rather than finding people that are gifted that can do the jobs and contribute and feel good about participating, right? Just what Mary said, we want to get involved with something, but we don't know what to do. Everybody has, find what you're gifted at and use that to build up the body. I think some people that come in and we assign them tasks that they're either not ready for or not gifted at or don't want to do, they're not going to stick around because this becomes not a labor of love. It just becomes a chore. I'm so excited. Uh, the group I'm with is, 
We just love being together. And we don't have time. It's just, we get together. I, let me just check. Okay, I'm okay for the moment. Um, but what I'm saying is that if we would help people understand, um, we learn things. I'll give you an example. We learn things, and they're right, and they're true. The law of Christ, there's certain things. You can't, we would say, well, you can't dress like that, you know. You, you, you can't do this. You can't live this lifestyle, or you can't do that. You need to, you need to change. But the idea is, uh, I don't think any, well, I don't know. Let, let's just say smoking, okay, because I used to smoke, all right? Let's say whew, smoking is, uh, let's say I say, but smoking is not good. It, it really is something you shouldn't do. And so you're coming and you say, well, I want to clean up my language, but you know what? I, I want to quit smoking too. But it's not easy to quit smoking, all right? Uh, even when you want to, or especially if you want to. So it's, it's a, you have to go through this process, but let's just say you do it and you quit smoking and you believe that a good Christian following the law of Christ should not smoke. Well, it's good. It has a good, maybe a positive benefit for you and you feel better. And you teach others. And you feel good about doing what you think is right. And now you feel righteous in your obedience. Somebody said, you shouldn't do it. It's good. You shouldn't do it. But if you tell others now, don't do this because Christians don't do this. And now I'm disappointed if I see you, if I catch you. What we have... And this, this is what imp kind of impresses me when I'm in D.C. or any capital now. How clean and pretty everything looks. But behind the scenes, the people are a mess. They're a mess. Don't be fooled by the distractions and the deception, okay? Because everyone has a story. They have reasons why they do what they do. Like Q says, and he's right, we... We have to tell our story, find a way to relate to them and bring them through a process and let them know that we're on the path. The path is eternal life and to have eternal life and to have joy is to be transformed and to get right. And then he provides for you, which is something we completely miss. And our family, everything is, is supplied for us. All our needs are taken care of, but we're not accessing it because we're trying to work things out. I did the same thing, Mary, where I just, well, when I get things right, maybe if I quit smoking and I'll come, uh, you know, I'm really struggling with drinking or something else, and I don't want anybody to know that. Um, and I understand it. So what a lot of people do, and you'll see this, is they start associating with the group, and they start looking like the group. And what I'm telling you is, that's fine. We, we need to be on the path we should always be guiding them back into call no man father, no man teacher. Why? Because this is what we should be guiding you into. This is what has the power to transform your life. This is something that you want to commit to when you're motivated. When you have, you say, you know what? I really want to change. My life's not going right. Um, <clears throat> I want to submit my life to something worthwhile and the resurrection confirms that's a historical reality that we have, that we're not like Moses or the law where we have a book of laws now where you follow these laws and you get to feel better about yourself because you, you do a good job following the laws or you can raise your kids better and they're nicer to friends and family and all of that. It's what is the power? The power of the transformation comes from this living word. <clears throat> and so... My encouragement to you, because I know you know this, is try to get past the distractions. Try to help people overcome this. There, and you'll know when somebody's motivated. That's why he says, seek and you'll find, ask and it'll be answered. The, que the answers are here if we stick with it. But I see so many people, and I, the term I use is arrested development. They get an idea, they say, oh, I want to be saved. They're, they do what they think they need to do to be saved, and then that's the end of the line. And then we wonder why, you know, there, there's difficulty. Um, no, disciples are disciplined people. Uh, and that's, I've given Gordon a hard time because 
he read the psalm, and in that psalm, the version he's reading, which is really interesting to me, uh, I have to take that back to someone I know in Lubbock, is um, Psalm 28. It's the, he said, the fruit of your hands in the New American Standard. All the other versions, ESV, NRSV, NASV, says the fruit of the labor of your hands. Genesis 4, 6, um, it was sin is crouching at your door. You must rule over it. You must master it. You must work at salvation. Why? Because to be transformed, we need to consume the bread of life and internalize it so that we can be that to others, but not so we can, even the shepherds or the elders are not there to tell us what the rules are. They're there to show us where we find them and how to guide us or shepherd us into that path and by sharing our story and our experiences that we have, we can relate to them and show them the joy you can have if you go through the process. But people get in that arrested development state. Um, you know, it's interesting that in the Bible Museum, you go through this whole thing and now we have the digital, you know, everything's digital and we have apps and you can have verses come up on your phone as the lock screen or whatever, you know. And so we have, we have people that send out daily verses. I love all that stuff. Um, but don't let it distract you from your own study. Here's something that helped me, and maybe it can help you, is I, I know myself, I know the disciplines that I lack. I'm much better at committing to others than even to myself. So I think it's always worthwhile to commit to a group, a, a weekly study, or something that you can do and then from there build on it and progress and there's so many good resources but uh, try not to be distracted by going to all the resources and not getting the word itself <clears throat> so I met this um, in my travels I met this older man and his wife and he was kind of struggling. I could see he was upset, and I gave him some information, um, you know, about some of the things. He has a similar story that I do, so we related real well. And I, I took me a while to figure out why why is he keep probing me? Why is he asking me these questions? And come to find out, it was because um, his grandkids are in the mission field, and he gets information. He doesn't know the Bible. Didn't think he could read and understand the Bible. And so he, he knows the group that his kids are associated with, but the messages are very disturbing to him. And he didn't think he could go in and read the Bible himself and figure this out. And I said, that you absolutely can. He said, well, there's, there's verses, when I hear them speak, there's verses that make no sense to me. And I asked him for example, he gave me some examples. And what, the, the, what he was saying, these, are, these aren't verses, these are different original language or they're, they're teaching a certain something. They're using this verse and then they're teaching something on it. If you would read it yourself, you absolutely could understand it. Uh, and so I think, I, I think because he's older and wiser and he's motivated because he's, he's very concerned about his grandkids that now I think I left him in a good spot where they're they're excited now about learning the word and they're they're committed to a group and so they're in it but he's motivated you'll find people that are motivated that want to make changes in their life um, we need to encourage them that it's the word that gives life and we need to be patient that's why over and over in the New Testament all the letters command us to love one another because our tendency is to want to share what we know is right and tell them what is right before they have any understanding. And uh, these cleverly devised myths and everything are what we're up against. Because people would rather spend more time, you know, watching video clips or other people's opinions rather than looking at the word itself. It's pretty, it's not that difficult to understand. So the, the lesson today is call no man father, no man teacher. Understand that we're accountable to this word it's written for us so that we can understand it. If we'll engage in the transformation process, then we can help others go through the process because they can see how it's working. But 
would anybody ask you for the reason for the hope that's in you? And I challenge people wherever I go because there's, again, if you're distracted and discouraged, then nobody's going to want to ask you anything. Uh, and so um, that, that was my challenge because spending time with one of my family members, you know, I can't tell them some of the stuff that I share with other people because they're just not looking for it. They're not asking for it. So it'd be a waste of time. But after about an hour and a half, two hours, I want to hang myself. This is so depressing. Your worldview is just, it's so depressing. Um, it, it, oh. Get into uh, a group, a study, like Gordon said this morning, where we make commitments. Uh, Q and Claudia are great examples because they have mentors and understand the, the, the value of committing to a group where sometimes you don't feel like it, but you'll go because you're committed to that group. What a value that is. And then from there, uh, I always looked ahead. Here's what always encouraged me. I got around people, like my Sunset family, they're all missionaries, 10 or more years in the field. Oh, what a great environment. And you just want to be like them. And I always, just like the experience you guys are having in leadership, I always looked at the future and said, I, want to, I can't wait to get to a point when, when this is not such a struggle and just a way of life, right? Where, it just, where I don't have to get up and force myself uh, to read this or do, it's just a way of life. Um, I teach my students, you know, that you can get this information anywhere. You can get good information. You ask questions, you'll, you'll get this uh, information. And every successful person says you have to be a reader. It, it, without question, you have to be a reader. And people always say, I'm not a good reader. I met you know, a small group in Michigan. They say, I just don't like to read. I say, well, you got to get over that. Uh, but I gave them some examples how you can find joy in that. But what, students, we have these English competitions where they do um, these presentations. And I'll leave you with this. Um, it's so exciting because we know this when we're young. You have personal experiences that are teaching you these lessons every day of your life if you listen. <laughs> Um, you guys will love this and it blows my mind that where I am in the environment that I'm working with that so many have this attitude this presentation it's an English presentation and he says um, pay now or pay later he said here's here's the pain and then he goes on to explain the pain he said you're gonna have the pain of discipline now to to have a successful life and a rewarding life. There's pain in the discipline of having a good relationship with your spouse or your children. There's pain, in it. it's work. Everything is work, but when you labor at it, you get fruit from it. Amazing. He said the second pain is the pain when you live your life and you look back and now you say, I have all this information, I don't have the energy, and now you live with the pain of regret. I wish I knew then what I know now. Oh, would my life be different? But there's going to be pain. Choose your pain. And it's human nature to take the path of least resistance, but it's so important. Uh, the resurrection is a historical reality. Um, get into the transformation process. If you, I know, so some faces maybe, I may not have seen, but if you have any questions or anything that you want to uh, bring up, we're going to sing a song. We call this the Song of Invitation. And if there's something that, you know, kind of welled up inside of you as you're hearing the words from the scriptures, these living words, uh, then come up and bring it up and let's talk about it while it's on your mind. Okay, let's take advantage of our family while we're together. So thank you for your attendance. Uh, in your attention. God bless.